Hi everybody, this is Allison Gilbert, the Marketing Bites Maven. I'm here today for Marketing Made Simple TV. Our host, Jeff Ogden, the owner of Find New Customers, introduces and interviews top experts each week. So you want to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Marketing Made Simple TV. I am Jeff Ogden, your host of the show, and we're really excited to bring you this brand new show. This is our first episode of Marketing Made Simple TV, and we're kicking it off with a great guest. Mitch Joel is the CEO of Twist Image, a digital marketing agency in, in Canada. And they've done some very creative work, and he writes a very popular blog. He's a speaker. He does podcasts. He does all kinds of stuff. Really interesting guy. I've heard about him for so long, and I'm so excited to have him on the show. So let's meet Mitch. Yeah. Hi, Mitch. Welcome to Marketing Made Simple TV. It's great to have you here. I'm going to start off with a question I heard you ask on a podcast. Very simple. Who are you, and what do you do? You just said all that. Um, my name is Mitch Joel. I'm president, actually, of Twist Image. It's a digital marketing agency. We have offices in Montreal and Toronto, and we work with clients like uh, Walmart and TD Bank and the Cancer Society and the, the Milk Council up here. And um, on this side, I also do things like blog over at Six Pixels of Separation. I have a podcast of the same name. I released a book in 2009, same name. And I've got a new book coming out in May 2013, so about a year from this date, called Control-Alt-Delete. That's great. And I want, I want to learn about your new book that you're working on. But, but first, let's go back to Six Pixels of Separation. I, I have not had a chance to read it yet, although I'd like very much to. So just tell me about the book. What are some of the ideas you brought forth in the book? You know, a lot of my peers have written books from a marketing perspective as to what businesses could do to use social media and this sort of new digital technologies to grow their business. And it wasn't the type of writing that excited me out of the gates. What I actually wanted to do was write a book about what it was like as a business owner, being an entrepreneur, having a couple of employees and trying to figure out how to make our way through the world. And we just sort of fumbled and stumbled onto blogging and writing was always a passion of mine and the publishing magazines prior to being in the digital space. So for me, it was this real natural way to express myself and to publish my thoughts and put those thoughts out there to the world. And lo and behold, the blog worked and led to the podcast and led to speaking events and book deals and all that attention really was all filtered in through Twist Image, my agency, to help us garner and build a bigger platform for the work that we were doing. You know, delivering great work, that was part of it. And then you get the nice word of mouth and referrals that come with that. And so the idea of the book was really to write a business book for business people using business language about what this new world means. Uh, and that was really the spirit of it. And thankfully, as the years have now gone on since the book was written and published, people seem to think that it resonates and still like to, to refer to it, which is great. Uh, knowing full well that there are certain things in there that are, are definitely uh, out of date or don't even exist anymore. And that our world has fundamentally changed. But the core of it, and I can say this because I just was recently reviewing it as I'm writing the second book, really still quite quite powerful, I think, in today's world. The message resonates as well today as it did back then. That's interesting. I, ha I have to pick up a copy and read it, even though uh, I share a lot of the ideas in the book are timeless, even though we know the social media world changes fast. Tell me about Control Alt Delete. That's your next book. What what kind of, what is your thoughts about what you what you're going to put into your next book? So the book is uh, you know, I'm, I'm close to being towards the end of writing it right now. I'm on about chapter eight of twelve, and it's been a, a really great experience actually. And it sort of all came together uh, this past holiday season when I was looking at some of the work we were putting together in terms of when clients ask like what's going to happen in the next five years and people at, at conferences where I speak would say, so what's next? And I sort of looked at it and realized there was actually these, these five major movements that have taken place that haven't really been acknowledged or absorbed yet by the business world. And so that, that was one part of it. And then the other part of it is we realized that, you know, when I speak to audiences, it's amazing how as each year changes and rotates that the audience members change. And I started realizing that a lot of these jobs that we sort of thought were real and valid a couple of years ago aren't even there anymore. And that 
that's probably going to change a lot going forward. And, and it sort of struck me during, during the holiday season when I was putting this all together that there are these five movements and for us to be effective, for us to be employable in the next five years, we need to change to fit and adapt with those movements. It's not enough to say something like, you know, social media changes everything. Well, then you have to change to adapt as a business person. And so the first part of the book is called Reboot Business, and those are the five movements. And the second part of the book is called Reboot You. And that second part is based off of what I call triggers or, or temperaments or ways in which you need to think to be viable and functional going forward in this amazingly different and challenged and exciting business world. That's interesting that you bring that out, Mitch, because, you know, I really I agree with what you're saying that the world is changing around us, but that means we have to change, too. And I think that's such a challenge for people to uh, continually adapt themselves. But one of the things I want to ask you about, Mitch, you do a lot of speaking and I've done a lot of speaking, too. You, I'm not quite as big as you are, but I try. But what, let's say there's somebody watching this and they'd like to get out there and do more speaking. What have you learned about speaking and what do you see as the keys to success? Well, I think part of it is just saying yes to opportunities to speak and present small, medium, large. It's, um, it's one of those things where it is very much like a muscle and going to the gym. The more you do it, the more you exercise it, the more comfortable and the more competent you get. At, at a core, I think there's a couple of key elements that need to happen. One, and the most important one, is know your content. I see too many people relying on their slides and their bullet points and a speech at a podium. Uh, it just doesn't work for, for me. I mean, maybe some people can pull it off. I think it's really hard to read in public, uh, to read out loud. I think it's a lot easier to just know your content and be able to speak to the value of your content. So for me, content is core. The other thing I would really recommend is spend some time studying it. I was very, I was sort of thrown into the fire with this, right? I've done a couple of smallish events and then my, my real first event was like a massive event in front of like 5,000 people on the same, there was Dr. Phil of all people, and another great lineup. But uh, I did serious training. I actually sat down, I went to do some Toastmaster sessions. I sat down with two presentation coaches. I actually worked with a friend of mine who was a stand-up comedian, had them come in, I did my presentation for them and then asked for feedback and any sort of areas that they thought I could improve on. I actually spend a lot of time just sort of studying and, and learning how to be a better speaker. Uh, I've read some great books. A couple of books I would highly recommend would be uh, Nancy, Nancy Duarte. She's got one called Slideology and one called Resonate. Amazing books. Uh, Gar Reynolds, Presentation Zen. Amazing as well. And then probably my favorite book and, and, and one that really sort of shaped how I approached this was uh, Nick Morgan, Dr. Nick Morgan. He's got a book called Give Your Speech, Change the World. So, those sort of three authors, I think, together really provided me with a lot of things to think about. And there's just a lot of you know, preparation and practice and, and just getting comfortable with the experience. It's now been six or seven years since I've been speaking professionally, and I'm, I'm way more comfortable and confident with it, but it still always is, there's always room for improvement. It's one of those things that you sort of constantly want to tweak and get better at. Those are great tips, and I think the, the thing you bring out that I appreciate, Mitch, is how hard you worked at preparing for it. I think that's great. An interesting book I just read on, on presenting, and I don't remember the name of the book, but the, the author is Steve Cohen, who's a famous magician. And, and he talked about the, 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 the things they use in magic to engage people, the language, the approach, not how to do magic, but basically how to work the room, making eye contact and working a room, et cetera. So, and the other thing I would always tell people is get a wireless mic and move away from the podium because <laughs> hiding behind a podium and reading slides just doesn't work. Yeah, you know, to, to sort of play on that, I, uh, I, I was really nervous about this big, massive event, you know, being on the same stage as Dr. Phil, it was a massive arena. And I, I sort of had this backup plan of like, what I'll do is have my speech there with me. And in case I get really nervous, I can just sort of like, grasp onto the podium and hold on for dear life and read my presentation. And I remember one of my, my coaches saying to me, it, do, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because we're human beings and creating barriers between you and the audience, which is what a podium does, is never a good idea. And the idea is actually to walk out to that front of the stage and stand there in the middle with, with you and really have your heart open. And I said, he said this and it's quite true. There's a magic in when you point your heart and openly to another person's heart, that that 
creates a more powerful connection. And I always think about that when I do my first sort of walk out on stage, I sort of stand there and just make sure my heart is very much pointed in the direction of the audience. And uh, things like that are very powerful. I'm with you whenever the, actually I actually have it in my writer, it says that if there are any podiums, they must be moved to the side of the stage. So I don't want anything in my way. Interesting, very interesting stuff. You wrote a post recently on social media and B2B and how poorly B2B companies are using social media today. Can you just tell me the idea behind the post and, and kind of why you wrote it? Yeah, I don't think people, I don't think B2B businesses are using it poorly. I just think B2B businesses are typically more skeptical of it. And the real spirit of it is when I do my presentations, I tend to show examples that might be more consumer oriented. And invariably at the end, somebody will come up to me and say, yeah, that's all great and dandy, but I'm B2B. And sort of like rolling their eyes. And when I look at that B2B as a construct, I do. I think it's about great testimonials and great white papers and great consultative sales and relationships. And all of those things are actually core values of social media. And I was just trying to make a point that if you're struggling to sort of find that best case study, perhaps that best case study is you and your business and that you shouldn't shy away from it. The real sort of grenade for that post was the fact that I saw a slide share got acquired by LinkedIn. And, and to me, it was just another indication that there's a massive movement towards businesses trying to figure out how other businesses can leverage social media to make themselves that much more effective at connecting. Think about things at a very primal level of like having a full profile about posting your presentations, why not to a slide share? And all those things seem so nascent and easy and obvious, and yet people are shy away from it, or they look at a deal like that and they think, really, like SlideShare for $100 million or for whatever the deal was. Uh, for me, it was very obvious that in a world where Facebook acquires Instagram for a billion dollars and LinkedIn acquires SlideShare for $100 million, there's, there's got to be more value in the, in the business side of this, in the business side of it. And I just want to sort of put a message out there saying, uh, there's no reason for this. If you look in the comments, it, there's a lot of people there saying their business is doing great stuff in B2B, and I, I see those opportunities daily. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big user and big fan of SlideShare, and I, I think, yeah, businesses really should use it, and there are a lot of reasons I don't have time to go into here. But one social media I, I want, uh, site I want to ask you about, because I heard Guy Kawasaki say that Pinterest is pretty much a waste of time because it's just about food and clothes. <laughs> and kind of, I, you wrote an interesting thing about it too. I mean, what is your opinion of Pinterest in its future? Yeah, I think Pinterest is really interesting. Listen, any platform that comes out and becomes more popular than LinkedIn in a short matter of months has value and has interest. Um, whether or not it's valuable to the people Guy Kawasaki connects to is, I wouldn't know, to be honest. But if you look at what Pinterest is at its core, it's fascinating because it sort of had when Delicious was really popular, which was a place where you could soak through images. And, and, and there are moments where I think, of, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a collection of these type of images or this type of content? And Pinterest is a great place for that to have happen. Um, you know, their growth is impressive. We sort of get very jealous or crazy when it comes to numbers. Oh, it's not as big as Facebook. You know, listen, any, any place that has a couple hundred million people is an interesting marketplace. So I, I wouldn't say I'm overly bullish on Pinterest. You know, it's yet to be proven as a business model and we'll see how long-term people stick with it. But you know, currently it's a, it's a hot darling and it's a, it, it's a tool that I think many people look for. I mean, we have a scrapbooking culture to a certain degree and this plays directly into that. You're right, Mitch. I, I think we're going to have to wrap up here for the first part of the show. So I just want to ask you is if people are interested in Twist Image and the kind of work you've done for the Cancer Society, et cetera, where could they learn more about uh, your company? Well, you can just go to www.twistimage, which is our corporate website, or you can go to twistimage.com forward slash blog and you can find me and all my stuff there. Great. I want to thank you, Mitch, for being on the show, and uh, I hope to have you on again, and we'll let you know when the show posts. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's it for today, folks. Tune in every week to meet new guests. And don't forget, support our sponsors. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. <laughs>